So we know we have layer two switches that create ethernet LANs. So all endpoints physically connect to the layer two switch. And if you're on a single LAN with one large VLAN, you are ready with this setup as switches work out of the box, making decisions based on MAC addresses. So these MAC addresses are already assigned to the NIC cards on your hosts, so you don't need to do anything. You could configure switches to say that this MAC address is available on this port, but it's better to have the switch dynamically learn this when two hosts connected start to communicate and send traffic. So if you want the switch to learn a MAC address, you would simply send a ping and it will do the MAC learning dynamically for you. But what if you want to send data from your network to another network or across the internet or just across different sets of VLANs with different IP subnets? Well, in this case, we need a layer three router. A router sends or let's say routes data from one network to another until the data reaches its final destination. So the big note here is that although switches look at MAC addresses to decide where to forward a frame, the routers use IP addresses to determine what network to send the data to. So one of the router's main components is the routing table. The router has a routing table that lists all the networks, i.e. destinations, that it knows how to reach. The router also has a gateway of last resort which it can be used if it doesn't know how to route a destination to in its routing table. So when you have multiple routers in the network, which you will, you're going to have multiple routing tables in the network that need to be maintained. So these routing tables can be populated in two ways. Well, firstly, you can add some static routes or you can have this done dynamically for you. So we have both static routes and dynamic routes that are referred to as routing protocols. What many do is for a gateway of last resort is just create a static route such as a default route which is used to catch all destinations that you don't know about and then you can redistribute this static route into the dynamic routing protocols such as OSPF. So the main point here is that we have routing tables and these routing tables need to be synchronized. And this is the process of routing convergence or convergence routing. And different routing protocols will have different convergence times. So firstly, we need to know about availability. And the whole idea of availability is to achieve continuous network uptime. And this can be done by designing a network to avoid single points of failure, incorporating deterministic network patterns, and also utilizing event-driven failure detection that will provide fast network convergence. And BFD is a, an example of event-driven failure detection. So network convergence is a time required to redirect traffic around the failure that has caused a loss of connectivity. So every application will have different latency requirements for convergence. For example, let us look at OSPF network using its default settings. So in these cases, it may take five or more seconds to converge around a link failure. Now this length of time may be acceptable for users reading internet website articles, as many of this is cached anyway by their browsers, but it really is entirely unacceptable for IP users using voice calls, and voice is very susceptible to latency and jitter. So we have several factors that influence network convergence speed. And we're going to define these as T1 to T4 below. Remember that the higher number of network prefixes and routers in your network will slower the network convergence times. So you want to use summarization at the border edges whenever you can. And if you're using OSPF as IGP, this will be an ABR or an ASBR depending on where the summarization is performed. But anyway, back to the topic. So the primary factors that influence network convergence are as follows. T1, time to detect the failure event. Then we have T2, which is time to propagate the event to its neighbors. And all neighbors need to have their routing table synced. Then we have T3, which is a time to process the event and then calculate the new best path. Finally, we have T4, which is a time to update the routing table and program the forwarding tables. So before we wrap up, let's have a quick look at continuous forwarding. So we have routers that can be designed ground up for high availability. 
So these routers will include hardware redundancies such as dual power supplies and root processors. So a root processor is also called a supervisor and consider this to be the brain responsible for learning the network topology and building these routing tables. An RP failure can trigger routing protocol adjacencies to reset and depending on routing protocol version timers this can result in packet loss and then network instability. Therefore, during an RP failure, it may be more desirable to hide the failure and permit the router to continue forwarding packets using formerly programmed Ceph table entries versus temporarily dropping packets while waiting for the secondary RP to re-establish the routing protocol adjacencies and rebuild the forwarding table. So we have two main high availability features here that allow the network to route through a failure during an RP switchover. Well, firstly, we have stateful switchover and non-stop forwarding. We also have stateful switched over and non-stop routing. So in summary, to achieve high availability and continuous network uptime, you really need to design a network to avoid single points of failure. You also need to incorporate deterministic network patterns and use event-driven failure detections to provide fast network convergence. You want to prevent packet loss by routing through a failure or proactively routing around a failure. And these features can accelerate network routing convergence. So we can have, for example, event-driven failure detection, such as carrier delay with BFD. That can be used in place of routing protocol keep alive timers to accelerate failure detection from tens of seconds to even milliseconds. So the link state routing convergence times can be optimized from one to five seconds to under one second through aggressive LSP or LSA propagation and SPF process tuning with OSPF when using as the IGP. On the other hand, if you're using BGP, BGP convergence can be improved through fast peering deactivation, next hop tracking, accelerated advertisement updates, and even tuning the underlying TCP protocol for faster update exchanges. A pre-computed backup path provides fast reroute forwarding options for packets while waiting for the routing protocols to converge around a failure. Finally, we have loop-free avoidance with BGP PIC that provides fast reroute capabilities by calculating a backup route before the failure occurs. So when a failure is detected, traffic is quickly redirected to the repair path within tens of milliseconds.